Again, welcome everyone. Today we have the first online session for coding interview preparation. All right, here we go. So uh, for those folks who've been with us for a long time, we used to be known as the Code Fitness, but we recently did rebranding for the Ingenious. Uh, as the brand which will unify Ingenious and Ingenious University for educational program. So now you're going to see the logo and change in our Facebook group. Everything going to be actually pertaining to Ingenious University. Uh, so I'd like to start with a formal introduction is who's going to be in this uh, online classes in terms of instructors. So um, obviously the main instructor will be Boris. Boris is currently IES developer at Tinder and uh, he has substantial experience uh, and academical experience with the algorithms and that's why he'll be the main instructor myself i'm igor uh, i'm uh, also engineering manager at tinder so we both work at tinder on the side we're doing a lot of teaching uh, you know different consulting uh, under ingenious brand and that's what we do uh, you know for fun and we enjoy and do that at spare time so very important um, administrative things. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you guys uh, have to uh, mute yourself when you join the meeting just to be courteous to your uh, student fellows. And uh, you probably, a majority of you received the email from us yesterday and I sent a follow up today. Please check your email boxes for the Ingenious University email. Uh, welcome message from, the, uh, from this class. It is important to look at this email and uh, follow a few administrative things such as Slack. Uh, Slack is going to be a number one communication uh, tool for our uh, class. We're not going to talk outside of Slack. And in the Slack channel, we're going to post videos uh, after uh, each session. And we are going to um, you know, communicate with each other and help each other on solving different algorithms. Uh, also, students will share um, their problems uh, from their current interviews and we will put them in database of our problems and solve them in our future classes. So another thing, we're going to use a GitHub repository, which is going to be open GitHub. Um, and uh, uh, that's where Boris will commit the code after each online session and you will be able to clone the repository and uh, work with the examples on your own. Um, so please double check your email boxes. Maybe your spam folder could accidentally get there. You might have deleted it. I resend to everybody who signed up until yesterday. I've seen there is one person I think signed up later today. I might resend email to that person. Um, I will check time to time for new subscribers for this online course and uh, uh, make sure they're gonna get uh, all means of communication. Okay. So what technology stack we're going to use for this uh, online course? We're going to use Java, which is the most classical programming language, and IntelliJ uh, community version ID. Uh, why we've chosen Java? I mean, it's most used programming language. I mean, quite frankly, it's not my favorite. Neither Boris like it as well, but it's mostly used for, for the algorithms and usually asked. However, during the interviews, uh, you will have a choice to use whatever language you like. So feel free to port all the solutions from Java to Python, Swift, Kotlin, uh, Ruby, whatever language you feel comfortable with, because algorithms are the same across the languages. Um, and solutions will look pretty much similar in terms of the approach. So, but again, we're going to use Java because it's more classical language for uh, algorithms. So class structure, it's very important to understand that uh, um, we have a certain way how we're going to teach this. And uh, we will look for your feedback after a few sessions. I'm going to send a survey and see how it works for you. And we're going to collect feedback and reiterate this. This class is for you, for the, uh, our community. And the main goal that we, uh, me and Boris try to achieve in this class is to help you guys at these hard times right now where a lot of companies doing layoffs to help you to pass the coding interviews because this is number one barrier to enter to the real interview is actually coding challenges. So this class is for you folks. So therefore we're gonna look for your feedback. 
So here is the class structure. We're going to introduce you to the problem. Um, we will actually have a discussion of how, I mean, Boris will obviously discuss with uh, uh, himself, right? Because <laughs> it's one way, a one man kind of show. Uh, and impersonate the communication between interviewee and interviewer. Right, and then we'll discuss how to uh, approach the problem. What questions have to be asked, you know, for the interviewer? Break down the problem, and then only then we're gonna call the actual solution in Java. The most uh, asked question interviews is the unit test coverage. Yes, you can actually write the algorithm uh, and write some code, but without you know covering all the edge cases, uh, you know, uh, it's actually we are testers end of the day, right? Majority of you are QA folks. So therefore, you will have to uh, unit test your algorithm and Boris will actually write not only solution, he'll write the unit test and uh, you know cover up different edge cases for that. Also, very important topic and always ask an interview is the complexity analysis. Okay, there is one way to solve the uh, you know problem, but there's also another hundred ways to solve the problem. Maybe I'm exaggerating, maybe not 100, but a few other ways. And obviously one way is better than another. And that's very important to understand the topic and Boris actually will cover that great in details in today's session. Uh, potential interviewer questions. We're actually gonna potentially predict what questions the interviewer might ask during such algorithm. And then at the end of the session, we will share with you in Slack channel all the Java topics uh, that uh, might be relevant to the uh, particular algorithm, right? What, hey, what do you have to learn? Um, could you please uh, allow other people to join as well? Since you're the host, uh, you can do this one. Yes, thank you, Boris. Thank you. Okay. I think people wait in the waiting room. So please make sure you join at 11 um, o'clock sharp so we're not gonna have people in waiting room um, because people are late and they get stuck in the waiting room. Um, we're still in the beginning and uh, we promise you this is the first and last uh, presentation, uh, sorry, PowerPoint presentation we're going to see for the entire course. Majority of the uh, uh, time we're going to spend in actually coding and that's what it's for. Please mute yourself. Um, once you join, um, please uh, make sure you mute yourself. Thank you. Great. Um, a few more administrative things uh, I would like to cover for new people who join. So again, uh, I'm going to repeat myself. Once you join to the online session, um, um, please make sure you mute yourself. Uh, we'll try to mute everyone. Uh, please try to join on time. I still see people trying to join right now in waiting room. So be courteous to your students and try to join at 11 sharp. We are going to have this online sessions every Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. We're gonna start at 11 sharp. So, uh, and then we are planning to do this for nine weeks plus. What plus means is that we are not planning to stop it. We want to collect the feedback from you. And if you guys are gonna enjoy it, we're gonna keep going. There's a lot of algorithms that exist in the world and we are trying to give it back to our community and help you guys to prepare better in tough times. So this is all for you folks, okay? Uh, again, Slack is the number one communication tool for this class. Although we're going to send the follow-up emails with the uh, YouTube recording uh, and also the point of the branch in GitHub repository, which will actually correspond to the algorithm uh, which the board is going to solve in the class. We are planning to invite guests. Like in the future meetings, we're actually going to invite people from Google, from other companies who will come and actually solve and show different algorithms for you as well. So Boris will be the main instructor for this course, but we're gonna have other guests as well. Um, please, again, let me go back in slides for those folks who just joined. The most important, let me actually show you that. Um, so as you can see, uh, this is the sample email that I sent myself to my Yahoo email box. You guys, supposed to go and find it. I sent it twice. Why this is email important? It has two links that you have to click on. Number one is the registration for the Slack. If, if you click on this link right here, you see on the screen, you will get to the Slack invite 
and get into our Slack channel. Automatically, once you register for our ingenious workspace in Slack, you will be prompted to the coding interview channel. And this is the main channel for communication. I'm sorry for repeating myself. There's a lot of people just joined. And another very important link is actually GitHub repo link. The GitHub repository that we're gonna use for classes right here. That's why it is in email. And we're also gonna share in Slack channel. Right after I'm gonna stop speaking, I'm gonna share everything that I'm talking today. If you like to see slides, I can share even slides with you so you can see that. Um, so all information, administrative things in this email. So please check your email boxes that you used for registering for this Zoom meeting and um, uh, follow the instructions. Okay, Boris, I think uh, my part is over. Let me stop sharing. You can take over my screen. And I'm going to keep admitting people as I see them joining. And uh, thank you, Igor. Everyone, I enjoy. Slack and that cannot find the link. And link is personalized, so everyone got their own link. And it is impossible to join for two people with the same link. Uh, so I think many people just cannot find the email. They probably deleted it or whatever. Probably we can resend uh, the emails right now. I will actually, I will resend the confirmation. I checked the Zoom, uh, you're right, Zoom has changed settings recently due a lot of hacks. A lot of people try to hack meetings. Uh, and that's why uh, Boris is right, it's personalized, personalized links right now. And uh, you will have to confirm uh, the uh, Zoom invite. And that's why I think a lot of folks did not confirm that. So let me, while Boris is gonna start presenting right now, um, I will go ahead and resend email to everyone and, and hopefully folks will be able to join. Boris, uh, please feel free to share the screen now. Thank you. Great, hopefully it's on my screen. Um, we have one problem here already that uh, we solved together in uh, the free webinar uh, the day before yesterday. It is a very uh, easy problem, which is sorter of zero ones. And this is only one in our repo currently. Uh, we won't repeat that, but uh, we'll do many more similar uh, problems. So hopefully you have time to practice later. Uh, Igor, should we wait for more people? a couple of minutes since they cannot join or should we go forward? Uh, since we're gonna have a recording for this session, um, I think let's move forward and we'll share with the Fox and Zoom channel the uh, all the recordings. Great, thanks. Okay, so today we have a first, uh, first session. That's why we won't do much coding, uh, however, uh, we'll talk about uh, fundamental things such as runtime complexity. Uh, how can we differentiate the good algorithm solution from the bad algorithm solution? Uh, what are the steps we need to uh, question ourselves and interviewer uh, in order to achieve better results on the interview? And many other interesting things that uh, will be extremely important in every uh, following session, since th this is the fundamentals, and uh, whenever we will do any algorithm, uh, we'll get back to those topics. So again, this is extremely important fundamental things. And uh, obviously, we should start from runtime complexity, which is basically how can we compare two solutions, because almost every single algorithm can be solved in uh, very different ways and some of those ways are easier some of those ways are more complicated however uh, it is really important to choose the optimal one so let me choose the extremely straightforward easy problem and uh, the goal of uh, this problem will be not to think on the solution however to show you how can we estimate and uh, evaluate the solution. So the problem sounds like, uh, wait, one second, let me create a new class right here. 
Um, so this is our uh, main project for this class. This project will be pushed into the GitHub repo Igor shared you via email. Uh, so after every single class, you will be able to find the solution there. Um, and by the way, we'll share, for those who doesn't know how to use Git and GitHub, we'll probably share a bunch of resources so you can learn this topic as well. So today we're going to talk about some elements in array. As Igor mentioned, we, uh, we've chosen Java, not because uh, personally I am keen on, on Java, no. Uh, Java is the most classic programming language and um, probably uh, the most, the biggest number of lines of code is in Java as of today. Uh, and GitHub, which is the biggest um, storage for, for the code, can prove these statistics. Uh, that's why uh, for, your, for you, it will be much easier to find some solution or explanation on Java. However, again, it's not required to use Java. You can uh, pour those solutions to any other programming language after the class. Moreover, we recommend to do that. Uh, it helps you to understand uh, the solution more, um, helps to understand it deeper. So it would be really beneficial if you uh, can go after the class and write the same solution on your favorite programming language. Uh, for myself, it's Swift. However, you might prefer Python, Ruby, Kotlin, whatever. Again, uh, today the problem is very simple. Uh, given array, uh, you are given an array of integers. And thank you so much, Kotlin was created, right? Uh, thanks, Anna, for your attention. I accidentally created Kotlin class since we have Kotlin bootcamp in parallel. Uh, so I need Java class and uh, some uh, element in array. Thank you so much. So uh, the problem itself is you are given an array of integers. Please return their sum or return sum of all elements. Um, sounds not complicated, right? But let's go slowly and um, try to think uh, more on each step of our solution. So the first question you need to ask yourself, obviously, is after you read the problem very carefully, um, you might ask what is our input solution, right? I input uh, parameter. And um, it's obvious in this particular task, our input parameter is array because we are given an array of integers, right? Awesome. Um, that's uh, where we can, um, so let's not, we're, we're not going to pseudocode today. Sometimes we're, we are going to uh, do some pseudocode, which is not Java and uh, neither any other programming language. Uh, today we probably will do the Java itself, um, just because of easy, easy problem for today. Uh, great. So let me create the public, uh, uh, not void. Uh, we do not know what to return yet, right? I will think uh, of the return parameter a little bit later. So something, uh, some elements, elements, and um, So we know the input parameter is definitely uh, array of um, array of integers, right? 
uh, this is given by default. Sometimes it's not that trivial, however, um, to identify what is the input parameter. Uh, sometimes you need to do some more investigation in order to understand that. Uh, okay, now, uh, what is return type? What is the type of return that we are asked to do? Uh, this is obviously not that hard as well because we are required to return some of all elements, right? We know that every single element is integer. Now we can understand that if we are going to sum all integers inside, obviously uh, we will get integer in a result, right? This is just a pure logic. Great. And again, we are going to talk on this example, we're going to talk about runtime complexity and different approaches that we can use. Uh, Now, uh, we need to sum every single element inside. Obviously, we will need to do for loop, right? We need to somehow iterate through every single element and store and accumulate the sum. So we'll definitely need some more um, temporary variable. And our next question, let me write all seven questions for us right here. So uh, we know what is input, we know what is output. What data structures and method associated with it will be used? Uh, this is easy enough problem, so we won't need any uh, additional data structures, uh, but in the nearest futures, we'll start using them as well. Uh, where are you going to store temporary data if needed? Uh, obviously, the less temporary data we, we use, the better for the algorithm, right? Because it's additional memory that uh, your execution requires from your computational power. And we're going to talk about this uh, today as well. Uh, however, uh, for this algorithm, we definitely don't need any big temporary data, data, right? We just need the only accumulated sum. So basically, we need some variable, let's say, uh, sum that is zero uh, by default and then we are going to slowly iterate through every single element inside our array and add the corresponding element to our sum so let me uh, give you any ex uh, some example let's say i have array and my array is uh, 5 1 10 uh, 24 minus four, something like this. So now we're going to iterate through the array. Uh, did I write any steps? No, I did not. This is our previous, uh, just previous stuff. Okay, um, how to iterate? There are many ways to iterate, by the way, in Java, right? So the modern Java language supports for each which probably is uh, okay for here because we don't need any index, right? We need just an element itself. To use the for each, you just need to uh, create some temporary element or whatever variable you need. And uh, you are specified that you are iterating through the whole array. In that case, every single execution of this for loop will give you an element, which is your particular element that you need right now. And the only thing we need to do is sum plus element, right? So the accumulated sum will be increased um, with the with with every next element or decreased depending on the on the element, right? Because we have minus four, which will basically decrease our sum. And as a result, we just need to return our sum. That's it. Very uh, straightforward coding problem. Um, now, 
before even go to the uh, going to a complexity, uh, let's see. Uh, we need to write some unit tests, right? And think about edge cases, which is extremely important as well. Uh, so. We are going to use uh, JUnit for uh, for tests, and I'm going to create the, another class, which is some element. I'll create separate classes for every single problem, so everything is very structured in the end. Some elements in array uh, test, and uh, we have already one unit test as an example. So you can just copy the annotation you need. And uh, with the help of this, uh, you will create some more uh, void functions. So um, test some elements. This. Um, great, we're using JUnit uh, Jupyter library for that. You can use a the unit uh, dependency you, you, you would like. So the first uh, unit test is always a happy path, right? So let's create, uh, first of all, let's create the class that we just created, some uh, elements in array. Uh, we know how to do that, right? Just creating a new instance of our some elements in array. Now let's create some real array which is um, which can be any array you want to test array can be can be one five minus five ten uh, four whatever expected result should be obviously six one, 11, and um, 15, right? 15. So the sum of those elements are, is 15. Now let's try to use some elements and uh, provide the array that we created. And let's create actual result that will sum our elements with the help of our algorithm, right? And now we can use uh, assert, which is JUnit, and uh, assert equals, for example. Um, and uh, for you, you, you should provide expected first and actual last. So expected result with actual result. This is very straightforward happy pass J unit test, right? So we have just an array and we know exactly what is the expected result, what is an actual sum there. So we test uh, our coding algorithm and uh, we're trying to make sure it actually is doing its job. Now, uh, good question to the interviewer here will be, um, can the array will is it possible for an array to be an, an empty array? Because all edge cases are usually in, you, you, can, you can think on the, of the edge cases in that direction. What if, what if the array is empty? What if the array has only one element inside? Uh, can we have negative numbers? All those questions are very good questions to an interviewer. Uh, any interviewer would appreciate those type of questions. So let's assume I asked uh, those questions and interviewer responded to me that uh, an array can be empty. So it's always a good idea to write a unit test with empty elements and make sure your expected result is zero, right? Because the sum of empty array uh, obviously is zero and it works. Uh, then you can try to write one element, some one element. In that case, you just provide one element five and make sure the expected result is five as well. Those are good questions. Uh, 
uh, again, uh, we have easy enough problems, so probably we need we can stop on on three tests. But sometimes problems are that hard that you would need to test them from very different sites. The more unit tests you have time to write, the better for the interview for sure. Um, great. And obviously, we have lots of students on, on this webinar, so uh, it's really impossible to answer all your questions right now. We'll try to do some Q&A session in the end. Uh, I see lots of messages in chat, but unfortunately, it's important to answer all of them right now. And yes, uh, I just answered in chat that, please guys, do not, we are not going to use a Zoom chat. It's very distracting and uh, we would like to be as efficient as possible. Therefore, let's post all the questions in the uh, Slack because Slack has a history, that's number one, and Zoom does not have a history. Once we end this meeting, this whole conversation is over, but in Zoom, we can still you know, uh, collaborate after the class. And uh, sorry, in the Slack. And just uh, again, in, in Slack, we can answer your questions even after this presentation and this session right so please if you would like to talk talk in the you know post the questions in the slack channel thank you absolutely thanks Igor. now the seventh step complexity this is uh very important questions even if you answered uh, absolutely correctly and you provided the correct solution uh, the chances are interviewer will not be happy unless you explain how efficient is your solution so you basically are required to know how to count this complexity and what is the complexity so let me start this story from the beginning let's assume some uh, algorithm, let's say our sum elements in array, has multiple possible solutions. So how can we potentially evaluate how efficient is your solution? Basically, we are interested in time, right? So attempt number one is how much time does the execution take? How much time does the execution take? So we can try to measure it with the timer, let's say, right? And see how fast is my solution and how fast is your solution. Can you think on some problems and unfairness with this approach? Please provide your answers in Slack channel. What is the problem of this approach? Why this approach cannot be truly fair the time approach try to guess absolutely all answers are correct so it's first of all it depends on computing power my computer is macbook pro uh, whatever year it is and uh, somebody has supercomputer, which is three times more powerful than mine, right? It's unfair. Um, moreover, uh, in parallel with IntelliJ IDEA, I might have three more browsers open and one computer game, which will slow down my, pro my processor a lot. And it also will affect on a speed. So obviously it's not fair approach for sure. Okay, uh, so I'll write uh, hardware. Um, other processes, processes in the background. And uh, I'll write uh, one more important thing, programming language. So it's not a secret that some programming languages are extremely faster than other. Um, 
that, than, than other languages. So obviously it's definitely a wrong approach, right? No, we don't want to measure the time. So how to bind the time to something more measurable, more uh, fair? And the best answer here is number of operations your algorithm needs to, needs to do in order to execute your solution. So number of operation is the real measurement. How to measure it though, right? I wrote the function, how to measure how many operations I need to do. And um, actually it's not that hard. Moreover, it doesn't depend on the programming language, right? Any programming language can be measured in the same way. So, um, first of all, let's try to, to brute forcefully count the number of operations. And by operation, I mean any single operation this computer will do while it's running my algorithm. So, we need to allocate sum, right? Which is one operation. Um, this guy, if my array has one, two, three, four, five elements inside, then this guy needs to be executed five times. So obviously, for now, let's, let's say this for loop will be executed five times. And then I need to return some, let's say it's one more condition, one more operation. As a result, I will need to do five plus one plus one, seven operations in order to execute the sum elements function. However, let's assume my new input is a little bit longer. A little bit longer. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Now this for loop takes thirteen times to be it should be executed thirteen times. Plus one, plus one, which is fifteen already. Okay, so now we understand that we need to bind ourselves somehow to the size of the input. That's what's really important. How big is our input? The more is input, the bigger number of operations we need to execute, right? So let's assume, and it's impossible to give a complexity for every single possible size of array, right? It's infinity. So let's assume our array has n elements. n elements. Where n can be any integer, right? So now we're interested to provide a result that will have a variable n inside. So our complexity, our number of operations will depend on n. Uh, can you count? with the logic I've just given you to you, how many operations we will have without big annotation for those who knows already. Perfect, thanks, Sergey. N plus two, right? This is an operation, this is one, this is one. So let's start from this. Sounds like we have N plus two operations uh, for this algorithm. And this is very true. However, Obviously, modern computers can perform around 100 million operations per second. So if n is 10 or 12 or 1,000 or even 50 millions, it doesn't really make any sense uh, to count this. It's extremely fast. The true challenge starts whenever n is huge, like billions or trillions or even much more, right? So some infinity. So whenever you're doing complexity analysis, you always would like to assume the N is something extremely huge, around infinity. We don't know how big it is, it is exactly, but we assume it's very, very big. 
And this is fundamental theory in mathematical analysis. If n is very huge and we are trying to add two, this two is, is nothing, right? It will not affect the result at all. So we can drop this two. We are not interested in this two, right? Because if n is billion, it doesn't really matter. One billion operations or one billion and two operations. And that means we can estimate this to around n operations. And in math, in math analysis, this around n operations, we can say that this is big O from M. This is very roughly rough estimation, right? So again, big O notation means, and you, are, uh, you can write it with big O parenthesis M parenthesis. Uh, again, by the way, mathematical analysis will say that you need to do some sigmas here and many other things. But for now, it is, enough, it is enough for us. We can say that our sum elements, comp runtime complexity is big O from M, which is also can be named linear complexity, linear time. Why linear? Because the function from M is linear, meaning no quadratic, no um, cube, nothing. Space complexity is our next uh, question. Very good. By the way, it's good to write here time complexity and eight is memory complexity. So this is called runtime complexity or time complexity. Usually we call it runtime complexity. Do you feel this is fair, fair way to um, to evaluate the solution, right? Because it doesn't depend on the hardware. It doesn't depend on programming language. It doesn't depend on anything but how efficiently you did your algorithm. And uh, I've seen some questions there. Uh, is it possible to do it more efficient? I don't think you can sum elements in the array more efficiently than linear time. Why? Because basically linear time, you do exactly same amount of operations uh, for your array, as, as the size of your array. If you have 100 elements in array, you cannot count the sum of them without going through every single element. So basically you need around 100 operations here. Now, um, let's talk a little bit more about this big O from M. What is it, how to feel it, uh, how to understand what stands behind this, those symbols? Uh, I'll try to draw a small graph here. Great. So let me draw runtime complexity graph. Great. On the horizontal axis, I'll try to write the input size. So basically, this is performance of our algorithm if size is uh, 10. This is performance of our algorithm is if size is uh, like, let's say 20. This is performance of our algorithm if size is 30 elements in array. This is performance of our algorithm if size is 40. And this is actual number of operations, e.g. time, because we're talking about the number of operation as about the time, right? Uh, that your algorithm requires to do. And we can say, and this is 10, this is 20, sorry for my horrible drawings here. Hopefully it will be more. Uh, sorry, yes. So um, we can say that th this is uh, our M, right? And this is our big O from M, which is number of elements. We can say that if we have 10 elements inside our array, we know that it will take around 10 operations. So somewhere here. We know if we have 20 elements inside array, it will take around 20 
uh, operations. If it will take 30 elements inside the array, if it will be 30 elements inside the array, it will take around 30 uh, operations in order to achieve the result. If it will be 40 elements inside the array, it will take around 40 elements to achieve the result. As you can see, this is line. This is linear, fun linear function. That's why big O for man is linear time or, or linear complexity, right? Sorry for my drawing, it should be like strict right, line here. And um, that's more or less good solution. Um, because if, for example, you have n square, uh, let's say big O n square, which is also very popular. Uh, then if you have number of elements 10, you immediately have 100 of operations, 100. And if you have 1,000 elements inside the array, you immediately have 1 million number of operations required to achieve the result. So graph will be something like this, very sharp. Um, okay, enough math. Uh, hopefully you now understand what does it mean. And uh, the idea is very sim sim uh, simple. You need to roughly estimate, estimate how many operations your algorithm will do with a dependency of n, where n is the size of the input. And you can close your eyes on small operations like one or two or whatever constant you have after n. Um, great. One more important question. Uh, does any loop without nested loops count for one operations? We will have many algorithms in this course with uh, quadratic, we go from n square and even log uh, from M uh, complexity, so I'll show you uh, how to count them for nested loops and for not nested loops. Uh, the next question is memory complexity. How much additional memory you your algorithm used? Which is also important because let's say uh, for my purposes I created um, another array, my array, or a like copy of array. Sometimes you need to do that, right? Sometimes you need to save your array to a copy and do some calculations on the first array, whatever. So if I did something like that, uh, sorry, it's array, of course. If I did something like that, right here, I allocated how many memory, how much memory? How do you think? It's a very good question, right? Because you don't know exactly how much memory you, did you allocate because you don't know the size of array. If an array is two elements inside, uh, arrays assigned is done by reference. Absolutely. Uh, that's another topic. I mean, you're right, arrays in Java are um, assigned by reference, that's true. However, uh, let's assume you did somehow allocated the, another array with, uh, of the size of your input array. What does it mean? It does mean if your array is one billion elements inside, you allocated one more billion elements in your memory. And it can be very expensive for your computational power. So the less memory you allocated, the better. Of course, we do not care if we allocated integer variable, like here. This is just one variable. My computer can handle millions of those, right? So same as here, 
we can close our eyes on those things, one variable or 10 variables or even 100 variables. We are only interested if we allocated some data structure that has size uh, of our input size. That's what is important. So our memory complexity, uh, this was runtime, right? Runtime complexity. Our memory complexity is big O from one. This means constant memory. And by the way, you can have constant time as well. I'll give you an example of constant runtime complexity as well. Uh, big O from one means it does not depend on the input. Whatever you will pass to this function doesn't really matter. You have 10 elements inside or hundreds of millions inside. Doesn't really matter. Your memory complexity does not rely on your input size. Can be runtime complexity. Uh, it's called constant. Uh, constant. Um, can your runtime complexity be constant? Yes, absolutely. Let's say you have such dumb task as uh, just return the first element of the array. Return first element in, of the array. So I would say public, uh, I mean, I need to write it here. Public int sa, uh, return first, if I just, sorry, first element um, and the input is array, and you just return array of zero. Uh, obviously, you would like to do some checks here, right? I can do something like if array uh, size, sorry, array dot length equals uh, zero, uh, then, then return, let's say minus one. This will be in our condition, right? If the array is empty, just return minus one. Doesn't really matter. So those kind of questions has runtime complexity big O from one, which is constant time. Why? Because it doesn't really matter. Your array has 10 elements or your array has billion elements. Both cases, it will constantly return the first element without any computation on it. Is it clear? So this is extremely important and you need to practice um, this complexity a lot in order to feel what algorithm has what complexity. The better complexity you have, the better and the more optimal your solution is. Every single algorithm that will be handled during this uh, coding challenge meetings, uh, we will try to talk about runtime complexity and memory complexity. Some of our algorithms will be, it will be hard to determine, uh, especially when you have some recursion. It's really hard to understand uh, what is complexity and how long it will take to run uh, the algorithm, uh, but we at least we are going to try to measure it. Igor, are you here? Yes, I am, indeed. I'm done. Uh, can you go back to uh, the uh, IntelliJ, thank you. Can you scroll up uh, for the six steps? Um, so basically, uh, I would like to reemphasize, uh, we will share these six steps uh, and uh, stick it uh, into the, on top of the channel nodes so you'll see them all the time. And uh, this is our basically approach that six questions, so it's actually eight right now, right? But we used to be six. So Boris extended it to eight. So eight things you have to talk through with your interviewer. So uh, Boris showed you a very, very simple, we call it this warm up problem, right? Uh, this is basically, uh, uh, you know, usually people don't even ask such problems in the interviews, but this is great. Uh, you know, this is first class as Boris mentioned. However, regardless if it's too simple problem to solve or it's too complicated, those eight steps are the same. And you have to talk to your interviewer. It's not one way street, right? When 
you come to the, let's say, is in-person coding interview, but majority of times is actually uh, coding screening. Uh, they give you 30 minutes and the person sits uh, on the other side of the Zoom or whatever, or webinar or uh, go to meeting, it doesn't matter. And they are asking you, here's the algorithm, you have 30 minutes to solve and then go silent. If you stay silent, most likely you will fail. Why? Because they want you to talk. And those eight things I want you to print out and put on your sticky note or print it out, put it on your wall next to your computer and use this formula when you will practice on daily basis on algorithm solutions. Time yourself for the 30 minutes and talk through this. So for instance, let's say the interviewer gives you a problem uh, to solve, uh, like polyndrome, very common one. You first question you wanna ask them, what is the input? And then you, you tell them, is the input a string? And they say, yes, okay, good, confirm. Then is the output, what's the output? Is it Boolean? Yes. Or if you say if it's string, she, she or he say no, right? And then before you're writing a single line of code, right, you have to go through these things and talk in out loud. And guess what? They don't expect you to complete the algorithm or have a perfect solution in one shot or have the best, uh, you know, uh, solve the algorithm in the best uh, way if possible. They want you to talk, right? And it's very important. I conducted hundreds of coding interviews and challenges on my own. And Boris did the same thing at the professional job. And both of us will tell you that the main reason people fail in coding interviews is because they don't talk, right? It's because they sit, oh my God, I don't know how to solve it. This is it. And after five minutes of trying to write a code, which is the completely wrong way to jump on the problem, you don't want to write code right away. You want to spend five minutes to answer all these eight questions before you're jumping to write the code. Because if you're not clear about the problem, if you're not clear about all these things, what's the point to code, right? Very, very important. And we're going to share this eight steps in Slack channel. We're going to share the video in the Slack channel. We're going to share the GitHub link with the branch with the solution Boris you today class. Uh, I'm going to share with GitHub tutorial for those people who do not know how to work with GitHub. Uh, it's a 20 minute tutorial how to work with Git and GitHub. Um, and also Boris will, will compile a list of topics. Like today we talk about, uh, uh, you know, complexity for algorithms. He'll share the, some, you know, uh, alternative tutorials to read about this or watch the videos about this. As well as today we covered fundamentals topic about loops. You know, uh, we didn't cover anything like in programming like crazy yet, like array and probably iterators. That's about it. Uh, and obviously, uh, Boris can show you like what you can do between now and next Sunday. What other things you can try to solve? Simple. I mean, for the first three weeks, we want you to go simple. We don't, we're not going to load you with a crazy complex algorithms. We're going to go with simple problems. And maybe after week three, we'll introduce you to the real coding interview challenges from real companies. You are not ready for them yet, right? Boris, do you want to add anything else before we end today's session? Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. So uh, exactly, I will share you with the more warm-up problems, such as Fizzbus, for example. Uh, I will share the links to uh, the lead code website. Um, so this is a website, which is probably number one uh, for coding interview problems. Uh, there are lots of more. However, lead code is my favorite. So uh, I'll try to share some warm up problems from lead code. However, you are not limited to them. If you have time, please practice. Please ask questions in Slack. Uh, into coding challenge uh, channel. Uh, and um, the more you practice, the more chances you have on the interview. Great, uh, I see Aaron asked the question about the pool of interview questions. Absolutely. Uh, we've been teaching for a long time and a lot of our students and uh, you know our colleagues shared with us pool of real interview questions from Facebook, from Google, Apple. We have a comprehensive list of actually what people are asking right now in the real job interviews. And we're definitely gonna cover majority of them during our session. The problem is uh, 
some of them require uh, a fundamental knowledge. We are not sure, we have right now 108 people in Slack and over 100 people uh, in Zoom. We're not sure that you, what is the level of your coding skills. That's why we decided the first few weeks to warm you up with the fundamentals, the basics. And then uh, probably when we see, you know, uh, comfort zone, again, we're gonna, we're gonna send the uh, uh, surveys to you via Slack, make sure that uh, you, uh, you know, you are prepared for this. And when you say yes, you all prepare, you guys all prepared in your uh, survey returns, then we will jump into the real interview uh, problems from real companies. Another question was from Stella, do we need to write J unit test as part of the solution as well? Absolutely. And right now I know in the Slack channel we have folks from our uh, former bootcamps classes, they can reply to this message. Absolutely. Every time you go into the coding challenge interview right now, they will ask you to unit test it. Um, because they want you to, at the end of the day, especially if you are in a testing role, even a test automation role, you, they wanna see how you think about the problem, right? What are the edge cases? And uh, uh, it uh, now becomes more and more mandatory. And also depends on the time. Let me give you an example. If it's 30 minutes or 15 minutes, very, very short uh, screening, obviously you won't have time to write unit tests, but they will ask you to talk to them. What tests would you actually put your algorithm through? At least you have to list number of test cases you wanna cover this algorithm. If it is one hour session and in depth session, then they will most likely ask you to write a unit test for that. Um, I think uh, we will uh, end uh, the online session right now. However, it doesn't stop you from writing the questions in Slack and we will try to, again, there's a lot of you will uh, try to reply to some of them uh, because there's so many people in this class. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll try to do the best as we can to accommodate everyone. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have this repetitive session for every Sunday. Every session is recorded, so we will uh, share the recording in Slack. I'm going to send email to every registrant and uh, with the uh, recording link and summary of the session. In case if you cannot make it uh, during the live session, you'll always get a recording, which is great. And uh, one thing I want to tell you guys, there is no magic stick. I mean, there, there is no uh, silver bullet. You cannot learn how to solve algorithms without solving them. If you would like to be successful at your interviews, if you would like to get the job, especially right now, the bar going to go higher. There's so many unemployed professionals out there that better than someone, right? So obviously the interviews will become stricter. So it means that algorithms now become a mandatory uh, kind of way to filter candidates. So the only way to get, you know, to the great level of solving algorithms is actually solve them. So if you are right now looking for the job or planning to go through the interview, please, please, I uh, will want you to uh, make sure that um, you solve them on daily basis. We're going to, uh, starting next session, we're going to send you more, uh, you know, problems to solve as a homework and you have to time yourself. And people asking like, uh, will be the uh, one point hour session? And the answer is today is the first session and we did a very simple uh, you know, problem. Obviously, as we move on forward to more complex, sometimes it might take about two hours. So the average of the session will be from hour to two, depends on the complexity of algorithm we're gonna review together in the class. All right. So uh, saying this, uh, I would like to thank you each of you to jumping with us, you know, uh, on this session on Sunday, and we hope to see all of you again following Sunday. Thank you guys, and uh, we will, uh, you know, uh, like I said, uh, put everything we talk about in the Slack channel. Talk to you later all, and have a great the rest of the weekend. Goodbye. Thank you guys.